This is a CNIB Foundation podcast. The content in this podcast is provided for informational purposes only. It is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. CNIB does not make guarantees about the comprehensiveness or accuracy of the content. CNIB and the podcast participants assume no responsibility for how you use the information provided. If you require legal advice about a specific issue, contact a lawyer or community legal clinic. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Know Your Rights podcast brought to you by the CNIB. I am your host, Jacob, and I'm really excited about this uh, this episode and the topic of built environment. Now, this is something um, I guess that we all encounter to some extent or one extent or another on a daily basis. But I'm joined by Diane and Debbie here who are really experts in this from a knowing your rights perspective. And from my gathering, you know, the built environment is everything from where, where we live, how we engage with the acoustics, the, the lighting, um, the, the entrances to facilities. Um, and that also extends into public and outdoor spaces as well. So I'm going to hand it right over to Debbie because I think that Debbie's got some amazing insight into um, really what that means, probably can offer a better definition than I can. So welcome to the show, Debbie. Thanks for having me, Jacob. Nice to be here. Yes, absolutely. So how would you define what the built environment is? Well, built environment, we all need to remember that when many people talk about built environment, it's not only about the physical aspects of built environment, such as ramps or elevators. Built environment also includes, uh, from my perspective, uh, serious wayfinding issues for people who have sensory disabilities as well as physical disabilities. I've, I've coined the term intuitive wayfinding, and I, I define that as using physical and or sensory cues to determine your best path of travel in an unfamiliar location. So if you are unable to read signage and you go to a place you've never been, or even somewhere that's under construction, for example, you need to make some intelligent decisions based on your environment as to what to do next. So that's how I define a built environment. Yeah, I, I think that that's such a an everyday experience is the the built environment, and I, I love the the term intuitive wayfinding. Um, you know, just that in its sense draws some really um, interesting visuals for myself. So maybe Debbie, you can share a little bit about your experience of how you got into, uh, I guess, coining that phrase and any experiences you've had with environments that you've uh, encountered in the past. Well. When, in my work with CNIB over the years, particularly when I moved into the advocacy space, um, I would be going to locations at least once a week that I'd never been to and may never go to again. So there were tools that I needed to acquire to feel comfortable and confident about going spaces like this. And so I would develop a little game plan before each, each trip And I always uh, maintained that your trip or your journey begins the minute you turn the key in the lock uh, and leave your comfortable space to an unfamiliar space. So that was part of how I did it. I also do a great deal of work with TTC, Toronto Transit Commission, and I'm on their Accessible Advisory Committee. So many things that come up during those meetings are best designs. Uh, It might be of a new subway station. It might be of a simple subway platform or a reconstructed station, or it could be a new bus, how the seating configuration is set. Um, I'm also a guide dog handler. So I have to consider using a guide dog in my travels, but I used a cane for over 30 years before I got a guide dog. So I'm very familiar with both modes of travel, and I do use technology to assist in my daily trips. Right. And yeah, and I think, um, I mean, that's a whole new kind of, well, I guess relatively new space is using technology to help navigate. But, you know, were there any particular um, kind of events that were particularly kind of 
I guess, influential in getting into this space for you? I, I think it's such a, a crucial space that, you know, maybe we don't consider because it's just such a part of our everyday life. I think my work with, with the government on uh, built environment in general and wayfinding, uh, I participated in the City of Toronto TO 360 uh, consultations and stakeholder engagements. And it really opened my eyes figuratively and literally to the hazards that can um, crop up for people who um, are traversing a space. And when I, when I look at traversing spaces, I try to think of it as a person who's never been somewhere before. So what I might take for granted whether it's familiar or not, somebody may not. Uh, for example, if you're traveling in Toronto and you're using Toronto Transit or you're going to a government building such as City Hall or Exhibition Place or um, Harbour Front Centre, a hospital to visit a friend, all of these buildings in, have their own challenges to traverse. And you don't want to be stressed out in doing the navigation to get there. If you're going to visit a friend, you want to be comfortable knowing that you can get there and, and out safely. So um, there's other factors like the time of day. What time are you going? Is the sensory environment going to be very different at night than it is during the day? So you, you need to consider so many factors. And I always look at it from a first time experience. One of the things that I'd like to pick up on um, that Debbie mentioned is inclusive advisory committees, um, like at the TTC. Consulting with persons with disabilities up front and proactively before things are built is incredibly valuable so that experiences can be taken into account broadly before something is built. And so instead of looking um, backwards after something's built and said, saying, well, you didn't do it right. Um, proactively looking for um, consultation with persons with disabilities is a really important step. Yeah, th thanks for hopping in there, Diana. And I'll just take this opportunity to just quickly introduce you. Um, you and correct me if I'm uh, just mistaken here. Diane, you're um, legal counsel with um, the ARCH um, Institute, is that correct? Arch Disability Law Center, yes. Perfect. And just, um, I know that we've spoken about this on this show before, but would you mind just giving a quick um, kind of overview as to what Arch um, does in terms of, I guess, human rights work um, within, it's, it's within Canada or within Ontario? Within Ontario, although we do do um, a significant amount of Canadian and international um, engagement with disability communities. Uh, Arch is Arch Disability Law Center has a provincial mandate, and our work is to defend and advance the rights of persons with disabilities. We do a lot of work under the Ontario Human Rights Code, but we also ask that um, decision makers take into account the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities when making their decisions, because we want to um, ensure that the rights outlined in the convention are also um, become, become a source of entitlement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think it's always... It's always such an interesting dynamic to have um, the way that we've set this show up to have um, some kind of legal perspective on things. But, you know, Debbie, to go back to your point, and as I'm kind of thinking about my own experience as somebody with, um, I guess, vision loss, um, it, it's 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 funny that we're kind of bringing this up. That's always my been in the past and growing up. My biggest concern of going to a new environment, you know, how am I going to get there? Am I going to be able to see which house number it is? Um, are, you know, how am I going to navigate an airport in a different country? Things like that. And, it, and it's so true. And I'm sure that a bunch of you listening or watching this episode have experienced um, those those feelings, those stressors. Um, and the reality is that the in, most environments have not been optimized for persons with visible or invisible difference. And the reality is, as you know, quickly, especially in Toronto, as things are being developed, um, a lot of the city um, of Toronto, and I'm sure other cities um, in Canada and the rest of the world, have already been developed. 
So if we look at it from a, I guess, a re-engineering standpoint, how does a building or a space or an environment, uh, probably most accurately, get re resuited to be an accessible space? Well, you know, Jacob, it's a lot harder to retrofit an environment. It's very similar to doing uh, digital content as well on websites. It's a lot easier to do it from the beginning. But as you so rightly indicated, that doing that is most of the cases are you have to go back and, and retrofit. It's, it's becoming a little more common now to do it with new buildings, as Diane has pointed out during the consultative process for new structures. And there are the laws keep changing, and that's another piece. But your point, Jacob, about you know finding locations, about doing this, you, what you need to think about um, is we did mention that it's not only about the physical aspects, but the sensory aspects as well. And the stressors that you indicated are absolutely true. You're never going to avoid all of them, but you're going to try and minimize those that you can. So some of the things that you need to think about um, if you have to retrofit a space is some of it's simple. Some of it, it it's simple of simply changing surfaces and within a building, you might use carpet to tile um, or textured pathways within a space to help guide a person along the best path of travel to reach a destination. One of the things that I tend to do now, and it's not something I did when I was younger, if I'm going to a space I don't know, I like to at least get when I get there, um, where am I going to be able to as receive assistance? How far do I have to go? Um, I'm not great at floundering around the space. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to make sure that I, I have an idea in mind when I arrive. Am I going to go to security? Am I going to go to an information desk? Is there people I can talk to who are walking down the pathway? But the, the, the simpler things to do is writing inside and outside, natural and um, incandescent lighting are also very good. Acoustical sound treatments. What type, what is the space actually being used for? Is, is it used for conversations or is it used for, uh, you know, eating areas? Because sound treatments really do aid people with sight loss and the same with good lighting in a space. Um, are there clearly defined decision points along a path to, to say, well, this looks like it's a hallway juncture. I'm not sure what to do here. The lighting's changing. I've got carpet under my feet instead of a tile path. Am I in a lobby or am I in a, in a, in a waiting area, for example? Color contrast and texture are big ones. And that's just inside a building. There's also getting to the space, which is another whole line of thought. What you pointed out, Debbie, is really, really critical. A lot of people don't ask for accommodations, which are the supports and services that provide equal access. A lot of people don't ask for them because they think that they're going to cost a lot. But the kinds of things that you've described, you know, carpet to, um, to tile, lighting, those aren't costly issues. They can be built into the design or they can, or you know, they can be added, um, making the access more um, effective for persons with disabilities. So accommodations don't have to be costly. Absolutely, and half the battle is knowing where to go to get them. I mean, you don't want to make too much of an effort for it, you know, but you want to be able to say, okay, I don't know where where to find out what accommodations I'm entitled to, and that's where your best resources are and you contact who you know, and you do some research on the web. But Diane, maybe you can talk about how people go about finding what accommodations are available. Accommodations are the supports and services people need to um, provide equal access to goods and services and facilities. In the built environment, there are a number of sources that um, assist people in identifying what accommodations they need. One is the um, building code, which is an Ontario law that sets out requirements for the interior of buildings, 
so the width of doorways, hallways, internal um, elevators, and you know making those accessible. Or there's the design of public stand public spaces standard under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act which uh, provides the uh, basis for accessibility for public spaces like sidewalks or um, walkways, ramps, curbs, things like that. So those two laws talk about the internal and the exterior um, rights to access that people have under the Accessibility for, um, accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. One of the issues with the AODA and the public standards are that there are limited ways to enforce the standards that are designed. So the minimum um, requirements for accessibility are identified in standards like the design of public spaces standard. All organizations, or at least most of the organizations in Ontario are expected to follow those standards. But if you find an instance where the standards are not being met, you can call the accessibility directorate and um, they will support you in self-advocacy tools, but there really isn't a fulsome complaints mechanism or response under the AODA. So the other way people identify um, what their rights and responsibilities are is under Ontario's Human Rights Code. And under the code, um, discrimination on the basis of disability is prohibited. So what's discrimination? It means that um, people are, if people are treated differently as, because of their disability, which is a protected ground, and it has a negative impact on them, then their human rights have been violated. And that's when the duty to accommodate arises. The duty to accommodate under the code requires um, organizations, um, employers, other service providers, um, housing. housing. It, it ensures that the supports and services that are necessary to get rid of discrimination are used in order to um, provide equal access. And it means that if those supports and services aren't provided, there's a ceiling called undue hardship that, um, that someone has to try hard enough, they have to try to the point of undue hardship to ensure that discrimination doesn't occur. So cost is one of the factors considered under undue hardship. But the costs have to be so high as to affect the viability of a business or an organization or employer because you don't want to put too cheap a price on respect for human rights and the duty to accommodate. That's absolutely true. You know, you really, really do need to think about, you know, how difficult is it going to be to make a simple change? And as you pointed out earlier, um, they don't have to be costly. There's really um, creative things that you can do at no cost that will, will be an accommodation for a person with a disability. I was just going to kind of jump in there with the, um, you know, undue hardship uh, kind of point. It's it's such a reoccurring theme in every single one of these episodes that we've done. And I, I really appreciate you very articulately and eloquently um, describing um, all of that information, because I think it's really important to reinforce that. Because when we're talking about knowing what our rights are, a lot of people, um, and myself included, um, are unsure what the point of a reasonable accommodation may be. And just reinforcing the fact that, you know, most people kind of think, well, it's going to be too expensive. I'm shy to ask for a, a computer and a, a big screen or whatever your accommodation may be, or a tablet or a certain phone. You guys can think of all sorts of examples for this. But especially, um, you know, within large organizations, governments, things like that, when we're talking about environments, we're talking typically about very um, 
large scale platforms. And if something is not being made accessible, um, you know, reaching out to the accessibility um, platform um, to get that those um, tools for self-advocacy um, probably are going to be, you know, a really great first step on that front. So I really want, you know, anybody who's listening or watching that really to understand that, you know, don't be shy to ask or to find out or to educate yourself. That's why you're watching this right now. You want to learn. And that's the, the best first step is knowledge um, and education about a certain topic. So please, please, please make sure to um, really um, make sure that you're not you know, holding back because your human rights, your your ability to function is priceless. So don't be shy of that. It's a really important um, kind of point. And there's been an amazing, um, I guess, process put in place of undue hardship that it's, you know, pretty, a pretty high standard to meet. So thank you for articulating that, Diane. And Debbie, I've actually, I, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, because as I'm thinking about this, I think that you've got so many great examples of, you know, um, and knowledge about the topic. But if somebody's listening or watching this, you know, if, if they were going to approach a new space, um, you know, what could people do preemptively to prepare themselves to be able to navigate this space in the best direction possible? And, and I'll give you an example to kind of get the ball rolling here. If I'm going to a, a store, for instance, that I've never been to, um, I'll search it on Google and see if there's a storefront image um, so that I can just start to, I guess, distill the visual of what I'm looking for in a, in a shopping mall, for instance. Um, lots of activity, distracting environments. Um, but, you know, and one example comes to mind. Um, stores that are not on street level um, are particularly challenging for me to locate. So I will always call in advance um, for any particular landmarks that I should be looking for. What advice might you kind of give to people who are listening and watching this um, along those lines to prepare themselves to, you know, navigate uh, uh, an environment optimally? Well, Jacob, as, as, we, as you mentioned earlier, and you as well, Diane, one of the things that getting, it's getting to the location, it, I break it down into a couple of stages. So first of all, you got to get to the location. And, and I tend to call this part thinking beyond the building. So I, I'm like you, the best way to do it, and I have found for me, and, and it's a good suggestion from others that I've gotten it from over the years, is do as much research as you can, call ahead, find out when you get there what you can do. But one of the things that, that is, is important is how are you getting there? Are you going by transit? Are you getting a ride directly to the door? And if you are, then how do you find the entrance? So a simple thing is locating the entrance. Is there a direct path to the door itself? Or is the path a circuitous one with bike racks and planters and different uh, uh, statuary in the way, making your route rather circuitous? Once you get inside, then you know you need to determine you if you've done some research ahead of time. You know, I got to go up on the elevator to the store, and elevators in general. Um, there's a real point about elevators now because they're, all elevators are not created equal. Um, there are different types of elevators and also lobby configurations. So are they facing elevators in the lobby and how far do you have to walk from the entrance to get to the elevator? Do you wish to get assistance from security or information desk before you get there? But the elevators, there's flow through elevators so that means you walk in one door and you continue in a straight line out the other side. They're, they're often found in airports or um, public spaces and, and TTC have them, different uh, transit agencies use them to get on and off of platforms. There's something cropping up now that we need to watch out for and they're called destination elevators. And those basically you press the floor that you want and there's a screen in front of you that will tell you um, either auditorily or visually 
what elevator to take that will take you directly to the floor you're looking for. The other thing in elevators, it's quite common now to see braille in elevators, but don't forget the audio, the announcing of floors, the raised tactile numbers. Those are crucial pieces. You might have gone to a to an office many times and they've changed the elevator. And because of that, you are now not able to get to the floor you want on an elevator because you don't know how to use the destination elevator. Th those are biggies. So I guess at this point, um, I think those are all really great points, but I I'm just going to dive in a little bit further. If somebody is um, not familiar or versed in doing the type of preliminary research how would you find out if there are bike racks um, or, you know, planters in front of a door um, or if there are issues with flow through elevators, things like that? I'm really curious to know what kind of resources and tools that you might use to um, find that information out. Getting in the weeds like this with the tools, I tend to use um, the technical tools, either uh, Be My Eyes or Ira as I'm approaching the space, if I can. Um, also, if I really don't have access to technology, I will call the space and ask them if they can meet me at the entrance. Again, you've eliminated a big stressor. It's a big step to take, though, um, because you need to think about, you know, call if you're there for a meeting. It's a lot easier to do that than it is if you're just walking into a grocery store. And let's face it, COVID has made things a little more interesting in that regard now with um, specific ways to walk within stores or specific entrances to use to get inside stores. I, uh, I used to use a certain entrance to my grocery store and it has two entrances, but it turned out that my entrance, the one I always used was now an exit, but I just, I didn't know that. So I just knocked on the door and they let me in. Uh, but they did tell me that. And I said, well, I really don't feel I want to train my dog to walk another couple blocks to go to the other entrance. So I will call you first before I come and let you know I'm coming and then you can watch out for me. And our vet is the same. So sometimes you a little prearrangement is necessary. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about self-advocacy. Um, you know, making uh, making that phone call, making arrangements. And I, I think that most people will find um, people are very willing to uh, accommodate and make those arrangements um, so that you can visit their store um, or location or meeting, as you said. But I just want to jump back for a second to something you said about a few of those resources. Um, I think you said Be My Eyes and also was it Ira? Yes, can you tell us a little bit about what those are? And we will have links to those um, in the description around this um, podcast somewhere for anybody who's interested. Okay, first of all, there's the GPS to get you to the building itself. And there's several of those out there that you can use uh, to, to access GPS. Uh, that's getting a lot easier now with the, the different uh, types of GPS out there. And if you want to provide links to those, you can as well. Um, but Ira and Be My Eyes are remote assistance apps that work in conjunction with an, a smartphone. So Be My Eyes works on any smartphone. You, may, you call and you can, and, and the same with Ira, you make a call to a number and a person will use your phone's camera to assist you to navigate the space you're currently traversing. So both of these services will assist with people to do that. The difference in the two services is that Be My Eyes is excellent, and but they're, very, they're only volunteers. And I don't mean only volunteers. I mean that they are not trained agents to assist you to navigate a space. So they may or may not tell you what you need to know as you're walking. They're great for uh, looking up information, reading labels and so on. But if you're going to navigate an unfamiliar space, I'm probably going to use Ira because those agents are trained to assist me and provide information to me that I need as I'm moving. I tend not to stop moving. Even if I'm not sure if I'm going the right way, I'm going to walk until I find something that indicates that this is not the right way to go. Because one thing about wayfinding for me, and I always talk about it in seminars that I conduct on wayfinding, wayfinding isn't only getting 
from where you are to where you want to go. It's knowing that you're not going where you think you want to go. So you need to figure out as you're walking, if you expect to find lots of people or a cafeteria or a food court on your route, and you don't hear that, or you don't see that in your travels, then you chances are pretty good you might not be where you think you are. Yeah. So it's important to know that. I think those are really good points. Dan, you had something to mention? Uh, yeah, one of the things that Debbie said that I can't, I can't overstate, it's so important, is preparation in advance, but also self-advocacy. That piece um, is critical because other ways of enforcing your rights will take time. Um, if you file an application to the Human Rights Tribunal alleging discrimination on the basis of disability, it could take over a year to have that application resolved. If you complain under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, as I said, there's no individual relief under that act. You can call bylaw enforcement and that may produce a somewhat uh, faster resolution if there's a bylaw um, infraction. But the time that it takes to to try and get your rights enforced is best solved by self-advocacy. Yeah, I think that that's a really important thing. And, you know, one thing that we do talk a lot about on this um, series is, you know, going to some type of enforcement um, agency should really always be the last resort um, to, to getting your, your needs met. Um, typically, you know, once again, knowledge is power, um, and especially in this circumstance, if you understand what you're entitled to and can rationally and calmly and articulately explain that to whoever the, um, I guess, um, other party is, typically you'll probably be able to find some type of resolution. Um, you know, once again, people for the most part are pretty understanding and accommodating and taking it to an enforcement bureau um, of any type should really be kind of taken as a last result. It is very um, time consuming on multiple fronts. Um, you may know that I'm uh, going through uh, that process uh, myself, and it's been a very, very time-consuming process. Um, not only the time it's taking to, uh, you know, get responses, which is still an ongoing process, but the amount of time I invest to properly articulate my, my story and um, all of that type of thing. So guys, I'm really encouraging you to try and resolve um, any disputes um, up front and, uh, you know, I, I guess collaboratively. So that kind of ties into my next quest, set of questions is the legal implications on um, public spaces, private spaces. Um, what, how does that get governed? How do we know what our rights are on that front? If you look to the minimum standards under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the, the standards that are set under that act for a variety of different um, daily functions are minimum standards. But as I said, there's no um, way to effectively enforce those standards. So it's a problematic response to um, a commonly occurring problem. Under the Human Rights Code, if you uh, think that you have experienced discrimination, as we said, you can go to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario and file an application. But that is, while it's a source of your rights, and while accommodation is a critical part of enforcement of human rights, finding out what accommodations um, may be available to you is a kind of different process. And it's a creative process because accommodations need to be individualized. Everybody experiences disability in different ways. And so what I need as an accommodation may be very different from what someone else who has a disability needs for their accommodation. So the individualized part is critical in the accommodation process. And as I said before, and as Debbie has pointed out, be creative. Um, accommodations don't have to cost a lot. Um, there are things that can be done to um, render a space more accessible 
like having tactile bear, um, markings, like having um, a difference in floor designs, like lighting. Those are things that won't cost a lot, but will make a huge difference to some individuals in terms of what it is they need to have equal access. Yeah, good, good points. Thank you. And I guess, Debbie, on that note, you know, I'm just trying to, to think about this from a perspective of somebody who doesn't really know what they need to be accommodated or live, uh, make kind of their environments more accessible. How would you go about finding out if, you know, changing the lighting in your, your home space um, or your workspace uh, might be uh, appropriate? Or if, you know, I think you mentioned changing from carpet to wood flooring might be more appropriate. Are there any resources where, um, you know, these type of modifications um, based on certain circumstances can be described or learned about? Well, some of the resources are probably in our own backyards. Um, if you have orientation and mobility instructors nearby, whether you um, use the CNIB or other uh, services, perhaps you're a student and you're learning about going to the university, uh, a brand new university space, um, talk to the disability services people at the university or um, Go and figure out as you go through your day, if you find you've done something in a task and it hasn't worked out well, uh, figure out as, you, as you're going through it, what is so hard about doing this? Why am I having issues with it? And, and be honest with yourself about it. Is it because you can't see to navigate the space? Um, is it because you're trying to articulate a situation and you're you're not being understood because you're not clearly defining what is needed. And, and that's, Diane mentioned this earlier as well. Be clear on what you need. Uh, don't just say that, for example, um, I, I went to the building and I got lost because, or I can't find the entrance. Uh, you know, Cause that way they're not clear on what could have been done to assist you to find the entrance. It might be uh, the lighting or maybe the driveway. You got, you know, down the wrong driveway. It could be a lot of things. Uh, always do some planning before you leave and minimize, go out of your way to minimize your own stressors before you start your process. Don't hesitate to ask people along your route. Even if you think you're going in the right place and the right direction, it doesn't hurt to do that little, you know, check as you go. And that's something that we often don't think about because we think, oh, yeah, we're, we're right. But, you know, you're, you want to be clear. You don't want to backtrack. I have a thing about backtracking. It really, you know, it doesn't make me very happy. So I try to avoid backtracking as much as possible. If it has to happen, then, you know, so be it. But there's also things like construction that are occurring all over Toronto and certain other cities as well right now. So expect to have some kind of issues in travel. It may not be serious, but always assume that it's possible that you may have to think about, gee, you know, I, I had this happen last time. Maybe I want to take a ride there this time or um, talk to property management in spaces. If you're in a meeting with someone and you indicate it was tricky to find, you know, where to, how to get there, let them know that. Don't hesitate to advocate, but be clear and articulate it as well, best as you can. Yeah, real, really, really strong point. And I, I hope that really resonates for, um, you know, anyone watching or listening to this, um, that self-advocacy is, is super important. And I know it may be challenging to articulate and to even have the confidence to ask for help. And one of the biggest strengths I think that all of us can, can find is it's okay to, to need help with things. Everybody needs help in some capacity. And if it's gonna make our lives easier, um, I'm sure and positive that most people will be very willing to help. That's just something kind of innate to uh, most humans um, is the willingness to help. I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, something um, Debbie mentioned recently with construction. Um, I was walking and I guess a little bit aloof to the um, my surroundings. I had my headphones on and I saw some kind of uh, orange construction pylons up in the distance. 
Um, and I thought maybe I could walk around it on Young Street. And there was a police officer there. And I don't walk with a, a dog or cane and have no visual indicators of my vision loss. And um, he immediately kind of started, you know, laughing, like, where are you going, buddy? And I said, well, I'm, you know, just walking up the street. And he said, what do you mean? You can't go that way. And I said, oh, well, sorry, I'm partially blind. How would you recommend that I navigate this? Um, because like you, Debbie, I don't like backtracking either. I'm always on a, a track forward. Um, and immediately the officer stopped traffic, walked me across the street and no problem. So, you know, people are willing to help you navigate to, to you know, really do what you want to do. Um, one point um, I do want to kind of transition to um, just quickly is online space, um, because this, I guess, is another environment that uh, is becoming increasingly um, popular for people to, uh, I guess, uh, engage in. And you're probably doing that right now, watching and listening to this. We're doing it, um, being on Zoom right now. So how does that kind of factor into um, environments and wayfinding and having accessible and approachable online space? One of the things I find with online space is, again, I approach it as if I've never been to that location. I've never been to that site. I've never been there. Uh, but if I go there, I try to glean as much information from the online site as I can. Uh, if there's a lot of um, more and more is happening online. And again, if you're a student, you may be involved in online learning and you're not used to the, the software, but you might need to indicate. Um, I've, I've taken part in some meetings uh, using different platforms. I've used WebEx, I've used Zoom, I've used Teams. And again, it's all of them have their own distinctive ways of doing things. And, and that's its challenge in itself. But there are resources out there to teach people how to use some of these. There's tutorials available. There's one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions available if, if you need it. Uh, there's um, the Get Together with Technology group uh, run by CCB. There's the CNIB uh, tech sessions one-on-one -on -one or in groups to help teach people about the, the online products that are out there today. And then once you access a site or a platform, get familiar with it. Make notes if you need to. Uh, it'll make your life a whole lot easier the next time you visit. Yeah, I, I think those are really good points. And we'll, we'll link some links to those resources you mentioned. Um, Diane, you had something to add? I do, because as a lawyer, I would be remiss in not um, telling people about what legal avenues are available should self-advocacy fail. Um, ARCH is a specialty clinic that, that practices exclusively in disability law, and the kinds of services that we offer are summary advice and referral, which is 30 free minutes of um, advice about particular legal issues that people raise. So for example, if self-advocacy in um, trying to get around an obstruction on the sidewalk doesn't work, call us and we can give you some advice or information about that. And if we can't give you the advice or information, then we can refer you to someone who might. Um, we also undertake taste, test case litigation which is um, taking on cases where there's a potential impact on changing the law or where a broader group of people, um, in addition to just the individual, will be impacted by a change in the law. Um, we do public legal education like this session to sort of be preventative in um, the application of laws to people or to let them know about their rights. And finally, we engage in law reform activities and we provide submissions to government or other organizations about ways to implement or change laws. Um, that will have a positive uh, impact on persons with disabilities. There are other resources like the Human Rights Legal Support Center, 
which um, is an independent agency from the government who provide also provide uh, advice or assistance with applications to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. There's Pro Bono Ontario, which would provide also 30 minutes of free advice. Um, but I also will add a link to something that I found particularly interesting and helpful. And that is um, a video on YouTube by David Lepofsky about barriers that he's encountered in terms of trying to access the built environment. And, you know, it, it comes from the place of a person with a disability who in a very new building continues to encounter barriers to accessibility. So I'll forward that link as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I think those are, you know, really important kind of things and resources to, to use if, if it gets to that point of, um, I guess, uh, dispute between the, the parties involved. Um, I know that we're running on our last few minutes here, but I did have um, one more question um, about online space. Um, and something that actually came up recently in a, an external conversation I was having is on, you know, on a website, for instance, um, is it, and, and if it's not, you know, accessible, Whose responsibility is it to make the website um, accessible? Is it the service provider? Is it the business's website? Is it the browser that you're using? Is it the software or kind of, uh, you know, to use two big examples, is it Windows operating system or is it the Mac operating system? Has there been any kind of, um, I guess, information on how to approach that? Um, you know, from, I guess, a legal perspective or a just a, a general knowledge perspective? There is an information and communication standard under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act that does set um, minimal expert, uh, expectations in terms of web content, um, what's expected from service providers and things like that. As, you know, the Human Rights Code is also uh, would also cover those kinds of um, issues. If you're experiencing discrimination, then you know whether you go to the website operator, whether it's the uh, the program itself, there would be different levels of who would who you would complain to. Um, so the code, the, the standard, um, Debbie, what do you think? Um, I, I agree with, with Diane on this one. Um, it is part of the <clears throat> information and communication standard. There's also the web content accessibility guidelines and commonly known as WCAG, and they're developed by the, our World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, and these guidelines are, fall into three levels of uh, compliance. There's also different versions of the guidelines. We're coming up to 2.2 now. But when you have a concern about a website that you have visited, if it's a business, don't hesitate to reach out to the business. Generally, probably by email is best. But if you're going to do that, Writing the business, it's the same when you have a built environment inaccessibility issue. Saying the website is not accessible isn't going to help that place understand what the problem is. It's best if you can give specific examples. I am trying to check out and I am not able to click the submit button. Or I'm, I'm not able to choose my credit card. Or I can't, if I'm on an airline site, I can't read the flight options. You know, I can't tell which flight is at what time. That way they have a better sense of where to go to fix the problem. Always also, if you, if you want to continue the dialogue, I worked with um, some of the sports sites uh, on their app as well, only because I wrote them on my phone and I asked them, you know, I, I can't. I can't tell what the score is and I want to find my favorites. So, you know, they wrote me back and I offered my email back to them. I always feel free to contact me and they did. And, um, you know, I, I knew enough of what my problem was, but 
try to articulate the issue you're having on a specific manner. Don't, don't keep it broad. They, they won't understand you perhaps when you say it's not accessible. What type of technology are you using? Are you using uh, a screen magnification software? Are you using a, a physical device, a screen reader? All of this information helps the business or the website provider understand what you're using and they may ask you for more questions. Yeah, I think that that's, that's the key, I think is, you know, I mean, from a, um, you know, a, a business perspective and, and having, um, you know, some businesses of my own, it, it's really, it, it's a common oversight, um, not intended um, that, you know, a, a program, software, website, whatever it may be, um, can be modified um, probably relatively easy, easily to accommodate for that need. So, yeah, I think being specific, having a, a direct result of what you're looking for um, in terms of an accommodation is really important. And giving as much detail um, as possible really helps um, developers, now we're talking kind of online space, um, you know, adapt for that. So, you know, um, I, I just have one, uh, one more question for you, Debbie. Um, you do some kind of, um, I guess, uh, digital consulting in terms of accessibility. Is that correct? That's correct. So if we, if, you know, there are any, um, I guess, organizations or business owners um, watching this or listening to this, you know, where would they reach out to you or organizations like you to find out how they could better um, accommodate their users? Uh, they can email me directly at, at dartbrell one at gmail.com or they can go through CNIB's uh, Frontier Accessibility uh, who also uh, do contact businesses. Uh, that way we can uh, use different usability testing setups to assist. I only, I tend to use a screen reader and mobile devices and uh, windows to do most of my testing. But if you're looking for an all round uh, type of support, then you may want to contact Frontier Accessibility at CNIB uh, to do that. And I'm sure we can put links in the, in the program. Um, and Diane has put it best about self-advocating. Um, if you're a good example of this is using the tab key. So if you're if you're expressing an issue that you're having, say I am using the tab key to look for the submit button, because this way your your website online space whatever you're looking at they can try the same thing, and with a screen reader. If you're using a screen reader, let them know there's a lot of there's free open source screen readers out there. There's NVDA, for example, uh, Microsoft Narrator also will allow you to do this At, again, no cost to the developer. These are both free uh, windows is built into narrators built into windows. NVDA is available as open source. So it, yeah, one time that wasn't the case. And, and now that it is, but it could be simply, uh, you know, changing your form label. Maybe your submit button doesn't say submit. It might just say button and you don't know what that means. So uh, some of these fixes, just like the built environment, don't have to cost a lot, but you know, they are, they are factors that you need to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to thank both of you so much for um, being a part of this. The insight and the the information and resources, which will all be linked in uh, the description somewhere around this podcast, uh, will be available for you guys to learn more about that. But I just wondered if um, either of you or both of you have um, some closing remarks, uh, maybe some words of wisdom to impart with our viewers and listeners here. I think what I can do is encourage you to call Arch for information or advice. Um, you know, we keep up with the recent case law on issues. So it may be that the issue you're concerned about has been dealt with already and we can provide you with details of that. Um, feel free to ask us to come out and speak to um, any audiences. We speak and provide services directly to persons with disabilities. We don't provide our services usually to service providers. So we could speak to a group of consumers who want more information on um, specific aspects of the law. 
um, yeah, we invite you to contact us. One quick question for you, Diane. Um, if there are um, viewers or listeners outside of Ontario, are they still welcome to contact you and you might be able to offer some referrals um, based on their jurisdiction? They can contact us, but unfortunately, we may not have the information that they want on their particular um, jurisdiction. What we can do is find an organization that may be able to help them in their own jurisdiction. Perfect. Thank, thanks for clarifying that. I know that we will have a, a national reach on this. So um, if you are outside of um, Ontario, um, I, I guess based on what Diane said, feel free to contact Arch and you can always contact the CNIB as well as an excellent resource. Debbie, any closing remarks? I guess my biggest one is don't be afraid to say you don't know because you're going to learn something if you if you do that. Uh, you know, right even the days when, you know, web was in its infancy, Many of us learned as we went along. And these are crucial bits that as you learn something new, you sort of build on it and continue learning. Um, remember also that my work primarily deals from a blindness perspective. So I use a screen reader myself. And for the built environment, I use a, a guide dog and a white cane. So um, I'm best to assist in that way, whether it's usability or whether it's advice on, on the technical aspects. But again, these are things that, you know, people work out as they go. And again, don't hesitate to reach out and say you don't know. Uh, that way people, you know, you're honest. You, you'll learn by saying that. Yeah, I believe there's the, the classic saying of uh, honesty is always the best policy. And I, I once again want to thank the two of you for joining me on this episode. Um, there's been some amazing information, some tools, techniques, and resources that anybody listening and watching this should really check out. And I just want to leave you guys with one last comment. Don't always assume that you're being victimized because something isn't being um, accommodated. I think it's really important to, to, to educate yourself, to advocate, um, but also to, to open a dialogue uh, in a calm and collected manner because most of the time, as Diane and Debbie have said, these accommodations can be very inexpensive, very easy to implement, but it's really about opening that dialogue. It's not that somebody doesn't want to accommodate you. It's probably the fact that they don't know how to accommodate you. And that's our responsible with, as people with visible and invisible difference to help educate and move this um, you know, movement forward. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, we'll see you then. For more CNIB Foundation podcasts, visit cnib.ca slash podcasts.